Well, thank you very much, everybody, for coming. I'm Paula Pérez, the mathematics department. And uh, we thank uh, Claire and Helen Van Ferguson to accept the invitation to be done once more here at Smith. Um, Helen Ferguson, he is both a sculptor whose work is located in institutions and collections worldwide, and he's also an internationally known mathematician. In fact, one of his computer algorithms, <coughs> the so-called PSLQ algorithm, is one of the top 10 most important algorithms in the 20th century. Uh, Helleman's mathematical sculptures in stone and, bro in, and bronze, in fact, some of the stone uh, is billions of years old, and I think one of his visions is that these mathematical works will last other billion years. <laughs> and they celebrate ancient and modern mathematical discoveries, and they meld universal languages <coughs> of sculpture and mathematics. Claire is an artist. She has written extensively on Hellemann's work. And she's a graduate of Smith College, where she was an Ada Comstock scholar. So there is a, Smith owns uh, the Aperiodic Penrose Alpha sculpture by Hellemann that was commissioned especially for Smith College, and thanks to uh, Marjorie Seneschal. And this sculpture was completed in 95 when Claire joined Smith as an Ada. And she graduated in the year 2000, summa cum laude, uh, Phi Beta Kappa. And uh, please help me to welcome them with an applause. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be back and to see the sculpture in a nice garden setting. Claire? I was an Ada Comstock scholar, and I thought that I was in Valhalla because all, all that mattered was my brain. It was wonderful. Um, I want to tell you something about the person that gave uh, this sculpture to Smith, Marjorie Senechal. She was here with a professor named Alice Dickinson, who became the Dean of Students, which in that time would be equivalent to the provost today. Alice envisioned a program for older students, people who were non-traditional age. And when she became provost, she took action. She asked Marjorie and Alan Weinstein to please plan a program. They had an idea already, following the GI Bill as a model. They planned it out, and it was launched under Jill Kerr Conway. The program was named after a dean at Smith who became a president of Radcliffe. Unfortunately, shortly after the program was launched, Alice Dickinson became very ill, and that's that was the sad end. She had early Alzheimer's. And now, I bet you didn't know that, that Marjorie Senechal helped plan, the, or planned the Ada Comstock Scholar Program, did you? It's a good secret. Okay. Yelman Ferguson's sculpture embodies essential truth, mathematical theorems, which he takes from the spiritual realm of pure reason and closed with forms accessible to us all. I'm reading my own words. <laughs> Leonardo da Vinci conceived the plan of observing all objects in the visible world, recognizing their forms and structure and pictorially describing them as they exist. Hillman, on the other hand, conceived the plan of observing objects in an invisible world. Hmm recognizing their forms and structure and encapsulating them in touchable, visible figures which he endows with sensuous beauty. These are not mathematical models, but the manifestations of the highest abstractions of human thought. This okay, go ahead and comment. You, you go. What? I'm doing right now is just uh, giving you a preview of the lecture, so you'll see everything, and we will return to these images, so there will be no test after this sequence. Stop. Stop it. Not yet. Oh, okay. <laughs> this, this is the reason we're here. 
this is the reason. And the stereotype has been that any kind of mathematically based art is cold and calculated. However, because Helaman presents concepts through abstract and sensual shapes of the human physique, they play to the senses. Thus, the genius of Hillman's work is a literal incorporation of the human body to convey the ethereal relationships of mathematics. And it works. Go ahead, Montana. Well, <laughs> we're doing two segments. We're doing the uh, aperiodic Penrose torus, and then we're doing a second larger piece which uh, is now at Stony Brook University. But the second piece involved a lot of new technology, which I specifically created. And it's massive. Aperi aperiodic well, when Penrose Taurus Alpha is the name of Smith's piece, <laughs> formally. OK, so now you've had a preview. We're going back. <laughs> and we will take up some of these topics in a little more detail. Isn't uh, technology wonderful? Mm -mm. You can get carpal tunnel syndrome there. Okay, this is the reason we're here is this uh, aperiodic Penrose torus, which. Uh, you gotta lie. Okay. Thank you. Can you lift that? Um, so we will we will talk in some detail about this. Okay, I'm going to talk now. Um, okay. This is Marjorie's piece. She donated it to Smith College. She planned to, and you're so lucky. Like the Minoan goddess who inspired her creator. We're not there. Yet. I know, but you can go there and then come back if you want. It's this little straw thing. Where is she gone? Well, she was before. There she is. She's the Minoan goddess. Notice the skirt and the narrow waist and the snaky thing she's holding. You'll see those. Like the Minoan goddess which inspired her creator, the Alpha Penrose Taurus appears thin from the side. Go back. Oh well. And voluptuous on top. And like the pleats of the goddess's skirt, the folds of the Taurus skirt fall from her narrow waist to the pedestal on which she stands. <coughs> Analogous to the two snakes the Min Min Minoan goddess holds away from her body, two dark snaky curves wind round the torus. One curves twice the long way and once the short way. The other curve winds once the short way and once the long way, creating a 2-1-1-1 one, one, one matrix. And while the Minoan goddess wears a tiled apron, aperiodic Taurus Alpha stands on the thick and thin rhombs of a Penrose tiling. This tiling relates to the 2111 matrix through their eigenvalues, which gives the coordinates for the Penrose tiling. Okay. okay. Now, if I can get a word in edgewise here. <laughs> Marjorie hates this picture, by the way. I just thought you'd all like to know. That <laughs> this picture is offered without permission. Uh, this is umbilic torus, NC. The NC refers to numerical control. I used a uh, CNC machine. This was back in 1987, before most of you were born, to carve the surface filling curve texture. The texture on there is a Hilbert curve because it was discovered by piano. And we will speak in some detail about another incarnation of this classification of binary cubic forms, action of uh, two by two invertible matrices over the real numbers acting on binary cubic forms. So this is the uh, stratification space. This is 27 feet high, eight meters if you like, 
on the campus at uh, Stony Brook University. You don't have that kind of snow here, do you? <laughs> this piece, this piece is at uh, University of St. Thomas. And notice, Claire's already mentioned the tiling that goes with the, uh, your piece. There is a tiling with this one. And actually, Marjorie had something to do, excuse me, Professor Senechal mm -hmm. had something to do with this particular tiling. These are two linking Klein bottles, and on the bottom here in this tiling, these are individual Klein bottles with rusticated sides. It can, in principle, give an aperiodic tiling. The question is, is this sort of the kernel of such a thing? This piece is in my negative curvature phase, negative Gaussian curvature phase. If you had really big hands, you could shake hands through this piece. This is at outside Olin Rice at McAllister College in St. Paul. It doesn't normally hang from a sky hook. <laughs> Yeah, big crane. We, uh, we uh, installed this piece. It was 15 degrees below zero. That's part of the dedication. This is the piece itself. And written on the piece are appropriate equations dealing with this negative Gaussian curvature form. This piece was at uh, the former Geometry Center at the University of Minnesota. And it was at that place that uh, Professor Senechal and I hatched our plot <laughs> for this piece you now have. This piece is at, is called the Eightfold Way. It's at, uh, and yes, the connections with physics are probably relevant, as well as uh, lectures in the Verisi Park. Notice that there is a tiling there. Now that tiling is a hyperbolic disk. Oh, go back, go back there to the guy walking in the mud. Oh, one more. No, we're not there yet. Well, you just went there. There. This is Helaman. This is the base for what he called the Fibonacci fountain. And he says he's up to his ears in mud. <laughs> it, it filled in with a lake, see. They had to drain the lake to put it in. And then it's a beautiful fountain. There's a fountain in its rainbow form. The steps here are Fibonacci number steps. There were 13 water cannons, which give you this effect. Actually, the profile of this is a smooth function, C infinity function, which is not analytic. Um, all kinds of weather. Uh, sometimes there are geese hanging around that fountain. They think this is a big mother goose. This piece is outside the Science Center at Hamilton College. This is called Syzygy. Anybody plays Scrabble knows the word Syzygy. It is comprised of a pair of hyperbolic tilings. What's the subject of Syzygy? Here is a Poincaré version, kind of rounded curves, archetypal male, female structure, Venus, and then this is the Klein model, Mars. Aha, but what uh, is this about? Not our, you know, people, men from uh, Mars, women from Venus stuff. This is the Mayan, Mars and Venus, the Mayan planetary system where, you know, they had their own 
personalities associated with these uh, particular planets transpired that the Mayans had discovered the retro how to manage the retrograde motion of Mars something like 400 years before Kepler. It's a good trick. And they did it with these hyperbolic tilings. Not. That's simply how I expressed their algorithm for doing it. This piece is at Arizona State University. And this is the complement of the umbilic toruses that we've shown you pictures of. And nearby here, Mount Holyoke College has this lovely marble piece, which I always thought died and went to heaven because it's got marble staircases going up to it. And across the vestibule is a, I guess, 14th century Venetian uh, fountain head. This piece was commissioned by Jean Taylor for her husband's work. And um, he had written a paper entitled Three Fundamental Constants of Euclidean Geometry. And I've got these fundamental constants there, one for three dimensions, four dimensions, five, and so on. And this has to do with um, also negative Gaussian curvature. This is at Princeton University. Now the subject of our current discussion. I'm, those whose art has survived and achieved that universality, acknowledged to be inspiring in Western culture, have at least until the 20th century had a common humanistic thread which translated into admiration for the human form. The crucial difference in Hielman's work, his means of communicating the esoteric essence of an abstract theorem warmly to his viewer is his constant reference to the human body. His un undying faith affirms that those ideas which he and others in the mathematical sciences known to be singular, elegant, and important may be understood as a celebration of the human spirit. And this is a celebration of the human spirit to me, especially a feminine human spirit. As you see, it repeats a feminine form in a singularly strengthened way. The, under the torso, there is strength. You can, you can see how steady and how powerful that form is. It's, it's not going to fall over. And the top to me looks, well, it looks like it's floral to me. And the color, of course, it's a garnet, a garnet pink granite. Carnelian granite. Oh. Um, just for the record, this is also an unauthorized picture of Marjorie. But this is the last chance I've got. <laughs> uh, this went through quite a number of stages. Here's the granite. And as a matter of fact, this was done in 64, 65. This was the, f I had to upgrade my studio because I had been carving marble mostly before that. Love to carve stone. It's a billion years old, you know, or more. And timeless mathematics expressed with this ancient geological stuff, I think, is what I really like to do. This carnelian uh, granite is from South Dakota. It's about a billion years old. So I had to upgrade my studio. This is a, a, a saw that's uh, got diamonds all around there. And then it's got a water thing on there. So water squirts through there, keeps the diamonds cool. Now- They get it, hot, they burn up. <laughs> just happened. Expensive. <laughs> just happened that uh, Claire was on the other side of the house there from where the kitchen was. And I just needed something to hold down this fire hose. A lot of water is generated.
Claire sir? might point out that I have certain boundary issues, <laughs> which is, uh, have already been exposed with those pictures of Marjorie. Uh, excuse me, Professor Senechal. That's my iron skillet. This, uh, you see the skillet there? It was perfect. I just drilled a bunch of holes in there. Right? <laughs> What you should do, and bolt it on this uh, fire hose. This connects to a bilge pump, and then this area gets filled up with water in the course of doing this carving. Now, what's going on here is your uh, granite sculpture out there is designed not to fall over if somebody climbs on it, or worse. And uh, so I drilled these holes in here. Now, I also have a compressor in my studio here. That's the base. This is the base. So this is a, a core drill. And I'm pre-drilling the block because there are going to be piece, two steel legs for this uh, sculpture to fit on. Now, I was using all this water, you see. And I thought, well, I've got a compressor. And on the compressor is a refrigerator. And on this refrigerator cools the air down so it's frigid. And uh, so I thought, well, why don't I just you know, run this core drill with this refrigerated air? Core drills are expensive. And on their ends, there's these little diamond uh, bits embedded in the steel. Well, I ran that for a while and then this core drill just wasn't coring. And what had happened was <coughs> diamonds are carbon. What happens if they get hot in the presence of oxygen? They make carbon dioxide. And there were a whole lot of little holes in my core drill filled with carbon dioxide. <laughs> Diamonds burn. So anyway, that's the problem. So back to the water and back to Claire's griddle. Okay, so there's the holes drilled. Now, here's the uh, base. This was a Penrose tiling. Professor Senechal knows all about Penrose tilings, probably more than anybody in the world. And uh, I figured uh, I would make, uh, get these thick and thin rhombs. You can see they're kind of rhombuses. And just kind of lay them out in a, you know, nice, artful, balanced, pretty way. And I did. And I showed these to Professor Senechal because she visited. And she looked at that and said, hmm something wrong here, something really wrong here. And it turns out you just can't pile thick and thin rhombuses together and get a Penrose tiling. There are rules, <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Artist. <laughs> so she taught me these rules. And so this is a correct one. This is a particular cluster and the granite piece is going to fit over those two steel rods and there's a kind of a plate of steel that it sits on. So it was designed so you can't just pry those up and walk off with them, you know, come graduation. <laughs> Here's uh, what I did after I got an approved version and then uh, that's the footprint. So let's see. Nothing uh, too much to griddle in action here. Uh, Can I say something? The reclining goddess. There's Sunset view. And there she is, absolutely beautiful. In all her glory. And right there where she has also died and gone to sculpture heaven in this beautiful garden. Yeah, it will be. Okay. 
Now we're going to talk about the umbilic torus SC. Umbilic toruses come in two flavors, outside, inside, or, depending on your point of view, inside, outside. I should say that that is at Marjorie's request. Otherwise, we'd just keep talking about the beautiful goddess. But she wanted to know about this last thing because it's huge. This is a radial cross-section of the inside-outside picture. We're going to talk about the one that has a radial cross-section, which is a hypocycloid with three cusps, otherwise known as a deltoid. You may recognize the cardioid. That's the radial cross-section of its reverse dual. Here's the two of them together, carved in marble. This is the one we're not going to talk about. <laughs> I used a special piece of carving equipment, and you see this little nodule on there? That was to locate the block with three ordered points. Okay, here we have the, a small umbilic torus NC, which I first did back in 1987, six. The form of an umbilic torus NC is a continuous donut-shaped surface patterned with a space-filling curve. It stands as a monument to the timelessness of man's creativity, as though it had just been unearthed with painstaking care from a Chinese tomb or a Mayan pyramid. Its fiance tinted bronze corroded by centuries of silent waiting. The space-filling curve is as mysterious as Egyptian hieroglyphics flowing over the surface, defining it, beginning at any point and meticulously returning to that point after traversing every inch of its area. The form of the space-filling curve is universal and known from the earliest architecture and ornament. Now we'll talk about a large version of this say eight meters tall. My head is not actually eight meters across. This is, is the, this is a surface filling curve and you can see where it starts down here, wiggles around, comes out up there. Now when I get done with this sculpture, you can walk over to it, put your finger on a part of its surface filling curve which I also used as a tool path, and track every inch of the surface three times around the long way, once the short way, and cover the whole surface. One single curve defines the whole sculpture. So I've got to take that, and this is genuinely a piano curve. Hilbert didn't swipe it. Uh, this is a three attic piano curve. So I have to wrap it around a torus, which I've done somewhat there. And then I have to convince somebody at the Simon Center that it's going to look okay there in the little quad that was selected for it. Dug a big hole, yeah. put uh, about 200 tons of concrete and steel. Now notice this thing right here. That is a conductor. It goes down into the base to ground the sculpture. Remember that Fibonacci torus, the Fibonacci fountain? Got struck by lightning. I have this problem with lightning. Started when I was three years old and saw my mother killed by lightning. Spent three years on the Fibonacci fountain, and then lightning hit it. Well, I don't want any repeat performances here. <laughs> and it blew it up. This is the base. At least in part. This is the quarry, where the base is quarried. We have here 55 tons of this beautiful green granite. Now, see that line there? That line is not supposed to be there. Does anybody know what that came from? 
Nobody on the campus skateboards? No kidding. No kidding. Okay. Here's the surface filling curve. So these are about an inch or so wide. Notice there are numbers on there, but if you think about those numbers, right, they're playing a, a role because when I went through the, so what I'm gonna do is a new process. This is not lost wax casting. This is casting from sandstone molds. I carved a couple hundred tons of this stuff and made 144 parts, which were to all be welded together. And on one of those, each one has its neighbors, and then this tells what the next neighbor is. Now I needed to build a robot to do this because I'm gonna create a surface filling curve that's miles and miles long. And so I built a special purpose gantry, five axis gantry robot to do this. This robot has a name, can anybody? Recognize that name? Stamatia. I met somebody named that. About the time I was taking this big pile of steel, it was on the floor of my studio and lifting it up and then activating it in this robot form. Stamatia is a name that some uh, Greek girls get saddled with, it means literally fallen angel. But I thought it worked really well for this robot. The robot, I had to do some wiring there. This is the uh, fifth and fourth and fifth axes. We've got pitch and we've got this way and we've got yaw. That's this is a rotating tool down there. So that's, to get this robot to work, I had to take all this engineering stuff. Robot engineers have their own way of thinking about things. Most of it inherited from Euler. They use Euler angles. Bad idea. <laughs> so I developed a fiber bundle presentation to the robot. Of course, I didn't tell it was doing fiber bundles, but associated with each point on the umbilic surface was O3. This would be the rotation group, giving the orientation of the uh, tool that I'm going to use to carve the surface filling curve. But no, didn't use O3. I used the unitary quaternions because things work out a lot better there. Here's the tool doing the cutting. And what this is doing, it take, took about an hour to an hour and a half for that tool to start out at one corner and wiggle its way all around and come out on the other side. Moreover, connect up with all the other 144 pieces. And because we didn't know if this process was going to work. There was a fair amount of anxiety. <laughs> so it's a big project to order all that sandstone. It's pressed, they're compacted sandstone and think you're gonna get a sculpture out of it. Uh, well, also we're looking at uh, the final weight of 20,000 pounds of silicone bronze. Yeah. Fortunately, we bought that ahead before the market took off. <laughs> Maybe we bought it and they thought something big is going down, but it was. Uh, this is a super sucker. Now, remember before I had all that problem carving granite with water? Well, here, this is a refractory material. We're going to pour bronze in it, molten bronze, and if it gets wet, it'll blow up and possibly, you know, kill everybody in the neighborhood. So um, we got to keep this dry, but I have to control the sand and this super sucker 
it can suck up bowling balls and babies and whatever, you know. Okay, here's some of the 200 tons of carved sand, stone, and uh, there were 144 of these I carved. Here's the process of pouring bronze. It's really elemental if you've never seen it. Uh, maybe you shouldn't. It's kind of dangerous. So bronze comes out and goes into these sandstone molds. And we get a big pile. This is after the things have been cleaned up considerably. I've got a few videos. I don't know if we're going to have time to see them, but you'll see what happens to the molds. Now, on each one of these, each of the four sides, there will be some code that says who the neighbors are. The welders don't know umbilic toruses from nothing, right? These are artists, and that's fine. They don't have to because all we, they have to do is learn the, you know, the alphabet and know the numbers one through nine and A through P. <coughs> Now, it took me a little while to learn to communicate with welders. They do not start counting with zero through eight, <laughs> which seemed perfectly reasonable to me. Nor were they happy about a I comma J presentation of these, this incidence matrix. So after some communication, it became 1 through 9 and A through P. This turned out to be quite important. The welders did not really have a picture of this. But they did a great job assembling because you can see some of these uh, little numbers, which are still on the piece. Now remember, all this surface filling curve stuff is supposed to line up into just one. Here's the top half. <laughs> this is a view of the Taurus assembly building. Needed to have a Taurus assembly building, right? This project was not dissimilar to, you know, building a big uh, rocket ship, but uh, anyway, yeah. except it kind of curves. <laughs> this is the top half. So this is what will be eight meters up in the air. Now if you're inside this thing, <laughs> this is what you see. It's really hot in there. In the summer it was 108 degrees in the shade and the welders were inside. We, uh, we, I, I like to think of them as exhausted. We lost, they quit. We lost a lot of welders. <laughs> it was too, it's too hard. It's too hot. And inside it's even hotter, of course, with, now this, with arc welder. This thing had to be welded outside and inside. This is the bottom half coming together. It takes a special personality <laughs> to crawl around on the inside. Yeah. Moreover, we had a, another special personality, uh, Jessica, who is an engineer and she crawled through the complete thing because she was in charge of inspecting this and making sure this thing didn't come apart and that the welds were all properly done. As Claire said, not all the welders came back out of here. <laughs> well, they came out, but some of them just, you know, got in for a little while and there really is such a thing as claustrophobia inside umbilic tori. I don't know if it's a special characterization. Here's the umbilic, the Taurus assembly building. That's one of Lots our, of people were really interested in what was going on here. One of our kids up at the top. This is our number two son. He's a mathematician. Keep going. This is More three of our sons, and two wives. granddaughters, and a baby, I mean two grand, excuse me, two daughter-in-laws and a granddaughter. Up on the top. They're, on, they're all on the, the top. Grand, they're on top of this thing, right? On top. They're up here. 
they're on top of this after it comes together. I don't know if Alana is going to remember this event. <laughs> I don't think so. But Alana has a little cousin growing right in there, <laughs> as it happens, who is now about two weeks old. Here's this surface filling curve being studied by my favorite Smithy. <laughs> and there you see the finished product. It's, uh, our, two of our sons there, both mathematicians as it turns out. And you can see the size that mass and even the mass of Smith's piece carries more weight than tonnage. It conveys stability, permanency, and community. It designates art's journey from two to three dimensions. Hillman's umbilic torus excites mathematicians because it is as much about the exterior or ambient space as it is about the closed form. What's an umbilic torus? A ring with a curve and a division of space into inside, outside, surface, and curve. It is the door between two dimensions to three and three dimensions to four and beyond. To mathematicians, it illustrates the actions of group representations on binary cubic forms. And thus endeth our oh, annotated lecture with one. A few annotations. OK, it comes another annotation. Excuse me. Our perception of space, that construct of, construct of intelligence and imagination, has been changed by mathematics since the Greeks. They discovered the principles of perspective, the use of which Plato thought deceptive. The Renaissance saw perspective's apogee, the creation of another reality, a three-dimensional space on two-dimensional canvas. In our lifetime, space has become an accessible void to be conquered both outwardly to the stars and inwardly to the fractal. The free unfolding of mathematics is in its age, its golden age. And one more. Just one more. The sculptor Constantine Brancusi observed, quote, simplicity is not an end in art, but we arrive at simplicity in spite of ourselves as we approach the real sense of things. What they think to be abstract is the most realistic because what is real is not the outer form, but the idea, the essence of things. Thank you. Would you like to show any of the videos? Well, are there any questions? Yeah, we can take questions as well. You could show the video and take questions. It's sort of self-explanatory. Why don't you okay. do that? Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Just there's four of them. Well, uh, these are uh, time-lapse videos of this umbilic torus project. So they look Your like little ants running stuff. around, but you'll see um, in quick time <laughs> you'll see this thing get me, made. Okay. This is my robot doing this carving. And it's quite a bit more than uh, real time. But even so. Yeah, it's speeded you up. You can see this surface filling curve being developed there. It's carved negatively. I'm carving it from the wrong side because I'm going to pour bronze into this. You can see more of it there. And then I'll get the positive form of this surface filling curve. Why did you need it so thick, the whole stone? Because the parts, right, there's 144 parts. They're all different. And oh, some of them, you know, are, are more curved than others. So it's because of the curvature. This one is deeper here shallower there, deeper there, and then you can see it doing it. Uh. So this is a little piece of choreography here. 
And when I look at that, I sort of see my brain doing something. I don't know how I can. I programmed it. everything about this robot from scratch. Um, the language I used uh, was Mathematica, but I perverted Mathematica to do this because I had to create a second language called G code, which the robot itself could read and understand. That's the super sucker, you know, in action. Note the steel toed boots. <laughs> So it uh, is now doing a border because it wouldn't do to pour bronze into what you just saw. It needs a border so that the bronze can come out of it. There's a fair amount of cleanup and so forth that goes on with the bronze itself. So this is one of the 144. All different. This. Uh, Tool, it's a diamond coated tool. I had it. I had them specially made. Now right now, uh, we've changed the tool, and it's doing those little letters. So that's the incidence matrix for all 144 of these guys. So you get the picture. I had a company in um, Minnesota make these diamond tools. They make diamond tools. It's, it's an industry. But I hadn't heard from them for several weeks and I asked my middleman, well, where is this tool? And he said, oh, uh, they told me that nobody needs tools like that. <laughs> this is now going on in the foundry itself. That's some of this uh, pretty expensive silicone bronze. Silicone, that's the fine art bronze in North America. So they're picking up this crucible. It's hot. You see the guy in the special suit? I wasn't invited to that. See the guy without the special suit. <laughs> and he's going to pour into this affair. carefully. So this bronze will go down in there and then <coughs> kind of erupt in a bunch of little breather holes. It's not unlike a volcano that's, you know, got to have breathing space. So you have to punch them? The holes? Yeah. You don't have to, but if you didn't, then the bronze wouldn't go everywhere you want it to go. What is it that's on top of the molds? What do you mean? Those boards? Well, in the volcano shape thing. Oh, that's just a cup. It's a filter cup. You pour the bronze in that, and it gets filtered, just in case there's any junk in the bronze. Here he's trying to put out the fire. <laughs> Question? Yeah. You talked a lot about your yeah. But you haven't talked much about your creative process. And right. I'm just yes. wondering, um, when you're starting on the work, how do you arrive at the forms and, and the composition? Is it, do you feel like you're discovering mathematical objects, or are you, or are you creating them, or? You want to get personal, is that what we're saying? <laughs> <laughs> All of the above. Uh, sometimes I have to create new theorems. So in the process of programming this robot to perform unnatural acts on sandstone, I created a whole slew of new algorithms, and if you like, you know, new kind of theorems. So it goes both ways. Sometimes I have a piece of stone around, and then I get inspired by that stone to create some new mathematics so I can do what I want with it. Sometimes I have some mathematics in my head that just will not go away, and then 
I got to find a good suitable rock. I think this one is done, isn't it? This is the Taurus assembly building. This is the top half. Stop motion again. I can't say clay motion. These are real people. Moving it. See those uh, collars there? They've been, we pre-welded those together. And as you can see, there's nine in each one. And now we're going to start piling them up. It's a trick to get the curve to go the way it's supposed to go, doing this backwards and inside out. Isn't it? And it's, uh, yeah, there, there's all kinds of interesting things that come up. <laughs> like we did it wrong. <laughs> like some of the welders weren't real good at reading. You know? <laughs> do, you, do you have to rent this building? Yeah, sure. So it's, you don't it's next door to my studio, and I just made an arrangement with the landlady and <laughs> told her I needed a Taurus assembly building. And she, <laughs> said, and she said, how much? I yeah. will give you. <laughs> and I said, you go, can you give me a special rate? <laughs> so that was a lot of activity there. OK. Uh, Here is here up at uh, Stony Brook University. And it's, the you piece can see, came in on two don't trucks. Don't want it to drop on you. <laughs> and so these shackles and all have one, to be set up. There were these holes that we died. left for the purpose Literally. of picking this up. There's a window there. How heavy do you think? Just this one is about 10,000 pounds. So there's a crane there off over to the other side to the right. It's kind of pretty seeing this amazing object sailing through the trees. This is the math tower there. On the other side is the Simon Center for Geometry and Physics. And so this piece is attached to that. Now you can see the crane. Great big crane. I love I love this. Oh. That was the bottom. This is the top. I'm glad there was a person there to give you scale. Yeah. Are you? OK, scale. <laughs> Six feet. <laughs> so this is about eight feet through. And how many thousand pounds was this one? This one was about the same. 10 to, OK. So 20,000 pounds. The other one actually was a little bit heavier because remember that huge uh, pillar that was embedded in the concrete, so to speak, that had all these uh, electrical cables coming up through there. There was a special construction in the innards of the bottom one, and you'll see. So here comes the top. So this is non-commutative. You know, you put the top first and then the bottom. It's not going to work out as well as if you put the bottom down and then the top. <laughs> if it drops. That's Tony Lost. Phillips, in case any of you know him. Years and Tony, if it drops, then it doesn't every big project like this, you need an inside person. <laughs> like for your sculpture, you know who the inside person was. No sculpture succeeds without this inside person. All the big ones that I showed you before had a specific inside person. Now, you may be amazed that this fits together. I am. We were not amazed because outside the Taurus assembly building, we put the whole thing together. And then took it apart. Just to make sure. You know, we didn't want to get up there at Stony Brook and, you know. Down it comes. And of course, fits perfectly. This is Patty from the Simons Foundation. <coughs> 
That's a well, tremendous I, statement of community. There are lots of people involved. That's the least. Engineers, She's welders. The, uh, executive um, director of the Simon Center. There's Tony over there. Remember the inside man story? Got to have one. Piece of advice there. <laughs> okay. So then this gets welded. Accountants. Then we've got one more after this one. So. Sit on top of that, or, or is it attached? Oh, it's welded. No, totally. <laughs> it's welded. Which one? Did you Outside, want? inside. Um, I think uh, the bottom. This one. Yeah. No. No. Next one. This one. Yeah. Yeah. Let's try that. Oh, that was exciting. What's the window for? Oh. Okay. When the two sit together. You've got to get up inside there and weld the inside seam as well as the outside seam. And there were other things. For example, all that wiring for the uh, grounding the possible lightning or other ambient electrical fields uh, had to be done inside there. You so, can see that space filling curve pretty well on that shot. Yeah. It kind of boggles the mind. You're willing to go over there and uh, you know get a piece of chalk and. <laughs> Three weeks later, you will return to this spot. <laughs> they had to drill holes in the sides to lift it. Those are bolts that you just saw. So the bolts go right through the bronze, and yeah, then the bronze these has shackles. to be repaired everywhere they did it. And then you fill the hole at some point. Uh, yes. Oh, yeah, you, have you to weld it. You fill it with bronze and do it all over again. Weld in the hole. No, uh, do the outside. Now there's welding that goes on on this surface filling curve. This surface filling curve has a, uh, you know, sand texture, which is very nice. But when you weld something up, it doesn't have this sand texture. So the welders and I encourage them to learn how to mimic this sand texture. So you can't tell the difference. Now this is a kind of a greenish color. This is antique verde patina, gallons of it. If the curve has a start and an end, or is it? I think you want. Uh, hmm. I think we've seen them all, but I think we just uh, different. Yeah. Versions. Okay. Well, there was one showing it all there, but you've seen. Uh, Can we leave that out? Slides of that. Any other questions? Yeah. Is the yeah. curve closed or does it have a beginning and end? No, it's closed. It's one single closed curve. And in fact, this was the tool path for creating the surface. There's no secondary cutting. One single curve did the whole works. And it was the tool path. That is, I used the curve. Uh, many years ago, I wrote a paper with some engineers, and we investigated the efficiency options of uh, using a surface filling curve as a tool path, because your typical engineering process is you just go back and forth, and if you don't like those ridges, then go back and forth the other way. But I thought a tool path might be cooler, aesthetically much more interesting. And it turned out to be 40% faster in most cases. Other questions? Thank you so much for your attention.